Nerd of the Third Power will begin in just a few moments, but first, here's a shameless plug of something we've been working on. A kingdom in chaos. Something is causing my town people pain. We don't know what is causing it. A rogue knight. Clovis's family has joined the choir invisible, and he intends to bring his family back one way or another. It was just one of the most depraved things anyone could ever be. Who, who murders a child? A stolen artifact. The Dreamstone is a relic, allows you to live your dreams every time you go to sleep. A demon prince. Something walking through the streets, just striking people down, left and right, people screaming and writhing in agony. And the only thing standing between the world of Faerun and total destruction. I have walked the Nine Hells. All good intention, all love, all compassion will bleed. Our three adventurers. <laughs> who have no idea what they're doing. <sighs> he's beauty and he's grace. <laughs> yeah, the world is basically screwed. Join Dr. Gonzo. Can I try my entreaty now to the bunny? Rabbit poops and then hops away. I think it likes you. The cat? No, 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 we're not doing this shit. Don't Stop give arguing! Him you know what? He down. killed me! He can go just suck it, okay? Skyblaze. You need you need to have you need to have access to her to divine power. So she heals herself by touching herself. That did that steady. And Dungeon Master Mike Dodd. Game Master Voice of God! On a brand new Dungeons and Dragons podcast adventure. So just to make sure that I've got our cards right, we have a town suffering from, uh, suffering from insanity-inducing nightmares because of a relic that was stolen by a rogue knight from another kingdom that will go to war with the first kingdom, a demon prince, and an army of the of the undead. Have I got everything uh, everything right so far? Yes. Good. I thought this was going to be complicated. Nerd to the Third Power presents Fools Who Ride, a Dungeons and Dragons adventure. Coming in February. They need to have divine power to poke someone with a stick. Okay, got it. You poke them with the other stick. Assuming they survive, that is. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, everything. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Nerd to the Third Power, your one-stop shop for all things nerdy and awesome. I'm your host and master of ceremonies, Dr. Gonzo. With me, as always, in this nerdy quest of awesomeness and looking like death warmed over is our resident anime goddess, the cat. Cat, yeah, uh, you look like we need to call a plague doctor. Oh, uh, gosh. <laughs> Which is an irony, because you play one in our other show. <laughs> yes, I I feel fine. So, physi so physician, heal thyself. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I really wish I were like a cleric or a paladin because then I would just like cure wounds, lay on hands, something to make this go away. I don't have the flu, but I'm not well. Um, and today was the first day that I was starting to feel okay. And then like on my way to getting home so that we could record this, I just started feeling horrible. And uh, now I feel like death warmed over, so I think I'm actually allergic to this show specifically. Because, you know, like, I started feeling bad about a week ago, so maybe like, uh... Anticipation time, virus? Uh, and maybe, maybe it's just like this show just makes me sick. I see how it is. Well, there's no need to be hurtful. I know no other thing to be in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, and uh, Birdman, how are you doing this week? Well, I'm doing all right, all things considered. Uh, still among the living, and uh, that's about all I can ask for. Since our last show, um, I don't know whether I mentioned it, I'm doing uh, the weight loss surgery, which is pretty pretty a uh, big deal. Um, and I'm on an extended liquid diet. I'm into my fourth fucking week of no solid food, and I'm still alive. So I'm doing okay, feeling pretty good, all things considered. I evidently have a lot more energy than I expected, so... That's uh, that's pretty good. I'm liking this. Good time. I, 
I legitimately, I just hear uh, Darth Vader going, impressive. Most <laughs> impressive. I'm going to crush this like a motherfucker. I, now I'm hearing Darth Vader saying that. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, so then uh, let's see. Uh, Skyblaze is not with us this week. Um, she is uh, unfortunately preparing to go to a funeral. So uh, she's taking some, some time to get herself into sorts. Uh, so we wish her the best, but she'll be back uh, soon. So uh, with that, we got a fun show for you guys tonight. Tonight we are finally discussing uh, a show that I have been really excited to, to talk about. The Mandalorian, uh, some would say the flagship show on Disney+. Plus. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun uh, to discuss. But first, there is some housekeeping that needs to be gotten in order. And uh, unless you skipped ahead in the video, the preview that you heard at the start of this episode was a preview for a new show that we've been working on, our Dungeons & Dragons podcast, Fools Who Ride, the first episode of which is going to be released next week. We are very excited about this. Mike has been running us through a campaign, my first Dungeons & Dragons campaign. I've actually never played D&D before, as I think I mentioned before on the show, so uh, this is... a. Uh, this is my first foray into Dun Dungeons and Dragons, good and proper. So, uh, Mike, why don't you uh, give our listeners kind of a, a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a taste of uh, what uh, what you had in store for us in this campaign? So, the Dreamstone campaign uh, kind of is an idea. Basically, I've set this in the Forgotten Realms, aka Faerun, and I invented a town that I've taken from a previous D and D podcast known as Cambridge, set in the southern area of the Sword Coast. And in this town, there is a Lord known as Lord Kilsh, and he has called our, our adventurers to his aid to help recover the Dreamstone. The Dreamstone is an artifact which gives Cambridge the unique ability among its citizenry to have pleasant dreams whenever they go to sleep. It's sort of what keeps people staying in the town, keeps people paying taxes, give, makes people loyal to Lord Kilsh because, hey, after a hard day's work, what's better than going home and knowing you're going to have a restful night's sleep? However, someone has stolen the Dreamstone, and people are going insane over it. And what follows is an adventure where basically there's a rival kingdom that has somehow gotten involving uh, magic and people being taken away, uh, also involving a slave trade, maybe. And uh, one person going insane and deciding, this isn't how I want it to be. I want something out of this. I'll give you the Dreamstone if you give me something back. And uh, our adventurers, we have a plague doctor who yes. we've had an interesting time with. We'll say that as a preview. <laughs> Never going to live this one down. Um, yep. <laughs> Marcus, the guy who won't let me fucking talk sometimes. Uh, <laughs> yep. but, but that's a rookie mistake and we're learning. And we have Skyblaze, who's our veteran D&D player, whose name of a character I can never quite pronounce. <laughs> and that's also a D&D &D thing is don't have a character whose name is so complicated you can't remember it. So that's on me as a game master because D&D is a system I haven't game mastered a whole shit ton. But I'm getting more and more into as time goes on. So, so far we are, I think we're more than seven hours in, I want to say. And, We're about uh, nine hours in. About nine hours in. So look oh forward God, to these. Really? Oh I know. God. Oh my God, you guys. We've played so much. And we've just entered the final dungeon. So what happens from here? I don't know. So uh, adventure, intrigue, and God knows what else will follow. And bunnies. I'll say that. Okay. So yes, uh, first episode of that is coming out next week. Uh, look forward to it. And then uh, basically, we're going to basically uh, it's the, our, our shows are going to leapfrog. So nerd, it's going to be nerd of the third power this week. Fools who ride the next week, then nerd of the third power. Fools, basically the shows are going to leapfrog. So every week we're going to be putting out some new piece of content. Uh, so every every other week it's going to be nerd of the third power, and every other week it's going to be fools who ride. So first episode of fools who ride is next week. So yeah, look forward to that. And so with that, uh, now let's go ahead and just jump right into the meat of the show, starting as always with our favorite segment, the Ask a Geek. And we got a lot of questions here. Uh, first one he question here, uh, this one, uh, the, the name on the email says Lark. So I don't know if that's his real name or screen name, but he asked me uh, my thoughts on the upcoming Pokemon Sword and Shield DLC. And uh, I'm really excited uh, for a number of reasons. First off, uh, they're adding in a bunch of new poke a bunch of old Pokemon back into the Pokedex, including my personal favorite, uh, the Electabuzz line. So I get to use my level 100 Electivire again. Yes, my son, I have missed you. 
Um, but as far as the uh, the the actual expansions themselves, I'm actually really excited. I have said for years that Pokemon could benefit from a DLC model, and I'm really excited to see that happening with Sword and Shield. And I really hope that Nintendo actually, you know, takes us and runs with it. I think it'd be really cool to see instead of getting a new Pokemon game every year to maybe have Sword and Shield be like the one Pokemon game and then getting more DLC expansions with new Pokemon as time goes on. Um, it's got a secondary question. Do I think that the addition of more old Pokemon into the Pokedex, if that's the first step of a long plan to get the rest of the Pokedex into Sword and Shield? Uh, I'm not going to make a, a, a definite, definite call on that. Um, but I am going to say that if that is the game that uh, Nintendo is playing, that it does validate what I've, what I've said for a while, that they have a plan uh, to incorporate the full Pokedex in some way. Um, I, like I said, I've never, I never saw Nintendo or Game Freak as being willing to just toss away all those old Pokemon that people have, that people have built collections of for, you know, almost 15 years now. Like, you know, there, there are people I know who are moving forward teams that they've had since Fire Red and Leaf Green on the Game Boy Advance back in 2005. So I don't, I never believe that Nintendo or Game Freak would be so foolish to just say, nope, those don't work anymore. So I, I've always maintained that they have a plan in some fashion. So this, I, I, I'm willing to believe that, yeah, this, this reintroduction of, of the 200 additional Pokemon is, could be the first step in such a plan. So I'm really excited for the Pokemon DLC. I've already pre-purchased both because I have both games because I'm fucking insane. <laughs> so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, let's see here. Second question here. Uh, this one comes from Damien and it is addressed to all of us. And his question is, what do we think of the leaked Colin Trevorrow script ideas for Rise of Skywalker? So for those who don't know what uh, this is referring to, about a month, about uh, well, not even a month, maybe like a couple weeks or so after the Rise of Skywalker came out, uh, there was a leak of some pre-production documents in, that included story ideas for what would originally have been Episode Nine uh, before Colin Trevorrow exited and Carrie Fisher died, and the movie had to be reworked into Rise of Skywalker. And there was a lot of uh, stuff in there that was very different from the final product that we got. So. Uh, Mike, did you see this at all? I did, and I thought a lot of it was really cool looking. I kind of wish we got in this version than the J.J. Abrams version we got. Um, I love the idea of Ray using a double-bladed lightsaber in not a dark side vision. I thought that was particularly cool. Uh, R2 getting shot, but not dying. That's what that's what they had to come out and say. Like, he's not dead. He's just really fucked up. Um, and just some of the other ideas. Uh, they were going to call it Duel of the Fates which is a nice link back to episode one, The Phantom Menace, with that particular track by John Williams. Um, yeah, I think this would have been really neat. I think we'll see these ideas incorporated somewhere down the line because Disney owns this IP material anyway. So maybe they'll recycle it in like a TV show or a novel or a comic book or something. It's, look at it this way, the like reading some of the leaked stuff has got me so interested in Star Wars again. I'm thinking about buying the new Marvel Comics series, and I only read Power Ranger comics right now. So that says something about the power of this IP. So uh, I'm excited. It was cool. Sad we didn't get to see it, but hey, it was neat. All right, Kat, what about you? Did you see this leak at all? I, I didn't. I actually deliberately avoid leaks of any kind for any, any franchise of Typically, because uh, when I see leaks, they, there used to be like a rig, really big problem with um, anime uh, content getting leaked, like um, um, like simul dubs and, and and stuff like that were getting leaked, and it's actually just really detrimental uh, to the franchise and to the fans. So I don't support leaks, and especially when Game of Thrones was in its final season and everything was leaks this, leaks that, and it's. It doesn't really do anyone any good, so I've always just avoided leaks in general. And and I kind of just, I mean, they can be insightful, but it it's it doesn't change anything really. I mean, it, it could potentially change, you know, if if some big revelation were to come out of it. But like, okay, the you know this it happened, and we can't go back and and change history. So we got what we got, and I genuinely don't care about the leaks that's that's just me so actually mike talking about 
what he liked out of them is the first time I've heard anything out of them. Okay. Well, for me, uh, I, I kind of skimmed the document, and uh, there there was some stuff in there that would have been really cool to see, but there was also some stuff in there that was really stupid. Um, it did confirm my suspicions that uh, Palpatine coming back was a rush patch job. Um, so, you know, it was nice to have that validated. Um, and I can... I can I can see I can definitely see where uh, the death of Carrie Fisher kind of threw a monkey wrench into the works of this because a large part of a, a large portion of the story that was planned was focused on her. So I do kind of see where it was kind of you know a, a good man died a bad death as far as this story idea went. Um, as far as how it changes my perception of Rise of Skywalker, it really doesn't. I've seen a lot of people online going, oh, you know, this this just makes me dislike Rise of Skywalker even more because they were they were planning on doing this, 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 and they couldn't do it. And I'm like, you know, it, it, it's to me, my thoughts on that are the same thoughts I have on the the rumored Snyder cut of uh of Batman v Superman, which is like, if I'm going to if I'm going to judge this alternate cut, I need to see the alternate cut. Until then, I'm going to judge Rise of Skywalker by what I saw in theaters. And what I saw in theaters was, I thought, stupid. So you know that hasn't that hasn't changed. So this, what what could have been has it has no impact on my thoughts on on the final product that we did eventually receive. So you know, it would have been maybe it would have been maybe it maybe this proposed thing would have been a better film, but we'll never know. So you know that's that's really all I had to say on that. I really feel like it's it's just people making an excuse to get angry about stuff more. I mean, that's just yeah. human nature. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we got mad because we didn't get the ending we thought we deserved after 42 years. But there's no... We don't know if this would have been any better. Sure, it had some cool ideas. But as Gonzo alluded to, there were some pretty fucking stupid ones, too. Um, so, we got what we got. Oh, well. Just give me my Obi-Wan series, which they have allegedly delayed. Um... I'm good. <laughs> I keep forgetting that's a thing, the Obi-Wan series. My well, God. Apparently not. <laughs> I can only get so erect for that because I love Obi-Wan. He's like my favorite character in the franchise. Um, and Ewan McGregor coming back. Oh, um, if I had a lady boater, but no, seriously, I, it got delayed because the scripts aren't where they're supposed to be. And Kathleen Kennedy says, hey, don't worry. It's still coming. We're just retooling a few things and you and mcgregor's is not to worry so i'm hoping my wise jedi master will not steer me wrong so we'll have to wait and see but we got plenty of star wars material like you're talking about the old republic being a tv series there's the high republic new era of movies they're talking about which is like within yoda's lifetime so it can't be all bad all right. Well, we shall see. We shall see. But uh, you know, as I as as I said, uh, you know, I I judge what I've seen by what was placed in front of me. And speaking of Star Wars content that's that's been placed in front of me, that segues nicely into our discussion topic for this week, which is Disney Plus's The Mandalorian, the first of what, as this conversation has shown, uh, to be the first of many promised uh, Star Wars shows and properties. And I can tell you, I was really excited to hear about this. And I was blown away by the final product. So uh, let's just just jump right into it by uh, first giving our, our general thoughts on this series. So, Mike, since you're in a Star Wars mania, what are what are your general thoughts on The Mandalorian? This is how you do the Star Wars universe proper. Um, it had the right people in charge. It had uh, John Favreau. It had Dave Filoni from The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. The right people at the helm writing it. You had so many things going into this right that could have very easily gone wrong. It got the right time period. It's set five years after the return of the Jedi. So the, so the new order has not yet risen in the galaxy. There's the Imperial remnant is still very much a thing which is kind of a leftover eu thing which is kind of neat they introduce the idea of the star wars underworld which we always saw a glimpse with like jabba the hut and uh boba fett and whatnot and i was just so impressed how good it looked it was good practical effects the costumes are on point they turned what could have been a marketing gimmick like with Jar Jar Binks and Ewoks, they made Baby Yoda something to give a shit about. Like literally right now, I'm wearing a Baby Yoda t-shirt. That should say something. 
the 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 hype around this show is so astounding that it crashed sideshow collectibles website um a little while ago because they put the child statue on pre-order for 350 bucks jesus christ i want this thing and it's life size it crashed the website i haven't seen that type of hype since revenge of the sith and that was 15 years ago so this series hit everything right it's a great time period it's a time period that's not well explored because of the new comics and new media because force awakens takes place 15 years after return of the jedi so it's got everything in the world going for it and it didn't fuck it up because it very well could have and this is a star wars series that's been promised since the late 90s like i remember when they used to talk about this on starwars.com so Fucking A. Star Wars is back. If it can maintain this level of quality, then I am all in. I will pay the Disney Plus subscription service gladly to watch this every year. Okay. Kat, what about you? General thoughts on The Mandalorian? Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't think I enjoyed it as much as other people did. I thought Certainly it, not as much as Mike. <laughs> certainly not. Um, because it overall, it's really good. But I think it, it still, in some ways, falls victims to being a short TV show. And that has its drawbacks, which we can uh, discuss later on in, in this podcast. Uh, but overall, really, really great entertaining show. Okay. Uh, for me, I really, I really enjoyed this series. Uh, I actually... Um, I, and not, not only did I enjoy it, uh, but I've been watching it with my dad, who he is like never been a huge Star Wars guy. And he would he, every week when he'd come over for our movie night, he would be like chomping at the bit to see the next episode of The Mandalorian. To, to, to him, this is the best Star Wars has ever been, which, you know, that that may not mean anything to you, to, to, to our listeners. But to, to, to me and the people who know my father, that's that's high praise uh, coming from him. But uh, I I absolutely love The Mandalorian and I love the things that it did and and how it took the it basically showed us the star wars universe from a different angle um one of my criticisms of the rise of skywalker just to, to, to address the elephant in the room was that uh it didn't show us anything new that we hadn't seen or hadn't been done before but we actually got to see some new some new facets of the star wars universe in this series uh that i thought were absolutely fascinating so uh, let's see. So with that, let's just start breaking the series down to its component parts. So uh, Mike, uh, why don't you give us a, a brief, brief summary of uh, the Mandalorian and its events? Okay, so I'm gonna do the t- the too long didn't read version. So I'm gonna kind of give you the elevator pitch. So the series follows the titular Mandalorian as he's out in the outer rim territory, so further from the galactic core than most people are used to. So nowhere near Coruscant. Think the area of Tatooine and Endor. He's way the fuck out there. So he is pursuing bounties. That's what he's hired to do. Um, and the bounty hunters guild calls him in and says, "Hey." We have this contract, but it's not on the books. It's Imperial. Okay, so that's pretty fucked up, but it pays a lot. All right, so he goes to meet Werner Ho- Werner Herzog, so crazy German director, otherwise known as The Client. So he goes to meet him and uh, says, hey... I want you to track down this tracking fob, which is a device which tracks a unique biometrics signature. Here's the last known location of said um, device and person. Please bring them back alive and there will be a substantial reward. And he offers him Beskar Steel, which is this Mandalorian type uh, ore, which is highly resistant to blaster fire and can even block lightsabers. So highly valued amongst the Mandalorian people. So he's like, yeah, okay, it's a job, sure, why not? So he does it, goes out to this planet, gets massive resistance, um, teams up with an IG series of assassin droid, though I don't know whether that's still technically what it's called, but anyway, um, teams up with him, shoots him in the back, because once they get to their quarry, they discover their quarry is a child. And IG-11, or sorry, IG-80, you know, yeah, IG-11 had orders to kill this thing. Um, And Mando's like, you're not killing a kid. So he shoots the droid in the head. And um, we find out as as the trailer or as the episode cuts away, it's whatever species Yoda is. And holy shit, it's a baby Yoda. And 
what happens over the next few episodes, he brings the baby back to uh, the Bounty Hunter Guild's uh, planet where he meets up with Carl Weathers, or Grief Karga, I think is the name of the character. And he's like, okay, I got the I got the quarry. I'm going to go take it to Werner Herzog. And uh, he's like, excellent. Here's your Beskar steel. And um, eventually, as the Mando's walking back to his ship, he's like, wow, I done fucked up. I just handed a baby to a monster. So he goes back, kills a bunch of stormtroopers, takes the baby back, and runs away. Um, what follows is a series of hilarious escapades as basically every bounty hunter in the galaxy is now after him because he's violated the bounty hunters code and, uh, the Imperials are after him. The bounty hunters are after him. And eventually he has to loop back to the planet because there's only one way this is going to stop. If we get rid of the Imperials and get rid of the price off his head and that kind of. I'm leaving a lot out, but that's the basic premise. Uh, along the way, he meets Gina Carano from Deadpool, um, the really cute MMA fighter girl who could definitely kick my ass. She plays a girl from Alderaan named Cara Dune, um, and she teams up with them. There's an episode that takes place on a New Republic um, prison ship, which is the first time we see the New republic in this series which is the new galactic government which has been instilled since the empire it doesn't control a vast majority of the galaxy because it doesn't have the military force to spread out across the galaxy but a lot of people recognize it as the former rebel alliance hey you freed us from assholes and we like you um so um they get back to the bounty hunters guild planets and they get ambushed uh, while taking the kid back to the client. The client gets killed. And then Space Gus Fring. So Gus Fring from Breaking Bad comes out as Moff Gideon. And he basically holds them uh, pinned down with a bunch of stormtroopers uh, outside this bar. And he's like, I know exactly who you are, Mando. And he's like, your name is Jin, and I can't remember his last name. And he's like, and Kara Cynthia Dune of Alderaan. Grief Karga, disgraced magistrate. So he's reading off all their shit. Turns out he's what would be the equivalent of an Imperial NSA officer. He's Imperial Security Bureau. So he knows everything. He was there at the Siege of Mandalore, or the Night of a Thousand Tears. Basically, when the Empire came kicked the shit out of the Mandalorians and made them a bit of a rarity to see in the galaxy proper. So he's like, give me the kid and maybe you'll live or I'll come in there and take it and you're dead anyway. So one way or another, I'm getting what I want. Um, once again, shenanigans ensues and uh, we get one of the most em emotional moments I've ever had in Star Wars. I'm not going to reveal what happens because to see it happen is so touching that I think you need to experience it yourself. But uh, then the Mando eventually gets away with the kid, but not before he meets another Mandalorian who he met earlier in the series known as the Armorer, who's sort of like a Mandalorian chieftain of some type. And the Mandalorian gets his sigil, which is important to his culture and his clan. He gets the Mudhorn. Um, which is the creature he defeated to earn his pauldron, I guess, which is, I, I'm not quite sure of the significance of it because I don't know a whole lot about Mandalorian culture, but um, he says, or the armorer says uh, to him, well, this child is now in your custody. This is your foundling. By all rights, this child is now a Mandalorian. So a baby Yoda Mandalorian your goal is to bring him back to his people or raise him as your own. And the Mandalorian's like, I don't know if I can do this. He's like, you don't have a choice. This is the way the Mandalorian code. And it's just, it's a surprisingly touching story of a guy kind of learning responsibilities. Cause he didn't have to go back and get this kid, but he does. And then the series ends with Moff Gideon. So space Gus Fring, uh, he was flying, I think, what's called a TIE Outlander. So basically a TIE fighter whose wings can fold down for atmospheric landing. Um, he cuts out of uh, his crashed TIE fighter because he lives, because of course he does. And it's a lightsaber that's cutting out of the thing. You're thinking, holy fuck, a Jedi? Until you see the color of the blade. 
the blade is black. For those of you that have been paying attention, who have been watching Star Wars Rebels and Star Wars Clone Wars, you know exactly what this is. This is the Darksaber. The Darksaber is a Jedi artifact that was given, or so that was created by the first Mandalorian Jedi. Um, and it's basically a symbol of power, basically who's allowed to rule Mandalore, as far as I understand it. I'm not still not all the way through both series. And how Space Gus Fring got a hold of this, nobody knows. But he was there at the Siege of Mandalore, so it stands the reason he probably killed somebody pretty high up to get this thing. And probably in martial combat, no less. Or his death troopers did it. But anyway... Um, and then the series ends right there. So season two comes later on this year. What's going to happen? I don't know, but they're almost done filming it. And my guess is we'll get a trailer for May the 4th this year, or we'll see something fairly. I'm actually really surprised we didn't get something for the Super Bowl. But uh, if I have to wait till May the 4th, I'm totally fine with this or Comic-Con. Don't give a shit. Show it to me. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's start to uh, break down this uh, series down to component parts. So, uh, Cat, what did you what did you think of the the story of the Mandalorian? Um, I thought the like the overarching story was good. Um, I was really interested in in the like the recurring characters that were there more or less. Um, I was interested in the story of the Mandalorians and and like their culture and all of that. And and then the whole Baby Yoda thing is really great. I really thought that the the squishy insides the the monster of the day kind of episodes were a little bit on the weak side um agreed which is to say that they they suffered from being in the middle of a tv show that uh that doesn't have like a i don't want to say it doesn't have a very strong story because it does it's just one where the the main story isn't the focus of every episode so what you have are these really great beginning and end episodes and then some just some okay stuff in the middle it's not good it's not bad it's just there it doesn't really move the story forward the characters are really gonna come back in or if they do the payoff will be so much later that it's just irrelevant so um i thought that that for such a short series uh that the 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 middle episodes should have been a little bit stronger than they were but otherwise the the overall arcing story was really good yeah i kind of I, I i i tend to agree um i really like the the stories that kind of advanced the uh the the, the overarching plot but there were some kind of weak uh filler, filler episodes. episodes yeah, yeah. The, uh, the 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 prison break one uh, was probably the weakest one for me. Really? Um, yeah. Um, but there, I one of the things I did like uh, about the series in both the main the the main story episodes and in the filler episodes was how strong the characterization uh, of our lead is and how many different facets of his personality we get to see. Uh, and one of the 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 bits that I think is the really strongest is uh, in the episode where he takes the kid to the. Uh, to the farm planet, which uh, is the episode where he has to defend this farming community from raiders who he finds out they have a fucking ATST walker. Uh, and you really get this sort of, you know, wandering samurai kind of vibe where he's, he's ingratiating himself to this community and you see him kind of giving uh, some serious thought to just staying here with the kid and, you know, just being a part of this community where he doesn't have to be continuously fighting. And I really got the sense, like, you know, he really wants this, but he also knows that, you know, he would never fit in. You know, it's not it's not a place where he belongs. And he, like I said, it's a very wandering samurai, you know, Western gunslinger kind of a uh, kind of kind of vibe. You know, so I, I swear at the end of that episode where he left, I, I expected some kid to come running after him going, come back, Shane. <laughs> I, I will admit that episode kind of got me a little kind of teary-eyed at one point. And that's something Star Wars has never done particularly well. It's never struck an emotional resonance, except maybe one or two times. Um, this really hit me. They're like The Mandalorian, I don't know, maybe I was in the right mental state after my father-in-law passed away. But when he was there stay, thinking about staying behind and where him and the kid are riding out on the wagon towards the Razor Crest, and the shot just looks back and you see him and Mando just taking whatever, the donkey, for lack of a better phrase, out of town. 
I was that was heartbreaking just watching all the kids watching their friend in Baby Yoda go away. Yeah. Um, and then another thing that I really enjoyed was how there there weren't a whole lot of characters that were cookie cutter. Uh, a, a lot of the characters, especially the recurring ones, they, they I felt like they each had their own personality and their own. You know, there 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 were very few characters in this series that I didn't want to learn more about. Uh, the two standouts being uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but uh, the Ugnot uh, that shows up in episode first shows up in episode two, Mister I Have Spoken. I was oh, like, uh, he, he was Quique or something like that. I can't yeah. remember his name. He he was just such an amusing character, and his his I, I loved his don't give a fuck attitude. I would love to learn uh, more about his his past and where he comes from because I got the impression uh, that he had been through some shit in his life. So I'd like to see where uh, where 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 he came from, and then another character that I'm disappointed that they didn't do more with, but I think they're probably going to bring her back for season two. Is uh, Ming Na Wen's character? Uh, God, I have so many thoughts. Uh, Thanix yeah. Shand. Uh, I, I, first off, I just love Ming Na Wen as an actress. Like ever since I started watching her in Agents of Shield, I've just, yeah. I've, I've loved everything I've seen her in, and she knocked it out of the park uh, in that episode. And I, I thought that they were setting her up to be sort of a rival uh, to Mando, uh, and then they, they kind of brought, they kind of, they I don't think they. Her. Yeah, well, like I, said, I don't, I don't, I think they're probably going to bring her back for episode, for season two because remember at the very end of that episode, uh, somebody the, walks up. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking that uh, that I, I, that that's that, 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 that that's what makes me think that they're not done with her because you, I mean, you you, you don't bring Ming Na Wen into a, into a series just to kill her off in the first episode. That, that was she, actually one of my major gripes with this series is what off they just wasted Ming Na Wen like. <laughs> Because they 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 announced some of the the guest stars so early that when I heard Ming Na Wen news in it, I was like, oh my god, this is going to be the greatest thing that's ever happened. I got so hyped up for it, and then she was barely in the episode, and then dies? Question mark. And I was like, how dare you do that to Ming Na Wen? <laughs> and how dare you do that to me personally? I was so mad. <laughs> oh, God. If they don't bring her back, like, this is one of the things. It's like, if there's payoff for this part, then maybe it'll have been worth it. But the payoff will take so long to get to. That, and there's so much on the floor they left with her because she's this informer imperial assassin who's taking contracts for the huts and everything. That's a lot of world building you don't just leave out on the table and not do anything with. Indeed, indeed not. So I'm and I'm, and I'm hoping that they that character in the Mandalorian and it's not relegated to, you know, side stuff like books and comics. I'd really like to see more more of her character on screen. But I mean, that speaks to part of the reason that the characterization of these people is so strong falls down to uh, the cast. So this is a good a good segue into our next segment of our dissection. Uh, and I gotta say, the casting of this series has, is just spot on. I mean, every every just about every character knocks it out of the park uh, in this series. And I love just the little moments of these of these of these characters interacting with each other, like especially between uh, Mando and the child. Just those little moments, like, no, that's not a toy. You know, okay, I'll get you something to eat. No, spit that out. You know, you get, you, you don't often get. It would have been very easy for for them to have Mando treat the child as just like a MacGuffin, just like a a, a piece of cargo to haul around. But no, they actually have him show like the little moments of him interacting with this kid. And you get moments like that with just about all the characters. Like uh, another standout uh, cast member is, let me find the name here. What's the character Uh, do? Gina Gina Carano. Carano. Yeah, Gina Carano is Tara Dune, who, another character that I want to see more of, uh, I just I loved her 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 and Mando's interactions. Uh, and it, you know, it's it's so easy to just say in a series, oh, these two characters know each other, and then leave it at that. But the way these two perform on screen, you really get a sense of history between these two characters. Like they, these are two people who they've known each other pr- professionally, if not if not on a friends basis, for many years. And I, just, I it's just absolutely stellar performances all around. I, I don't yeah. know if this is true, but I heard that she did her own stunts and all the other stunt doubles were yep. terrified to work with her because she would fuck them up. 
Yep. Well, I mean, that doesn't that background. Yeah. yeah, she she she's a mixed martial artist, so no, that doesn't surprise me in the slightest. <laughs> no, so I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm running with that head cannon that absolutely everyone was. Ter- her well, she also <laughs> carries herself with such charisma and such screen presence. I mean, she could have been a one and done character, like oh, that's a former rebel shock trooper, which essentially doesn't mean anything. But no, that's the type who the t- people that the the alliance would drop into a hot zone first and would fuck shit up with her. You believe it. She's not some waif thin. They didn't just cast her because she was a woman. They cast her because she was a woman who was capable and could do stuff. She looked cool. Yeah. She's basically space a. Rambo. <laughs> I want like, th- I want the toy of her so ridiculously bad, but I'm not paying $90 for it. Uh, another. She's basically the wife of every person on the internet who wants a wife who will just stomp on them. She's yes. wife. She's wife. <laughs> and moving on. So, Kat, who was who, who was another uh, cast member that stood out to you? Um, I really liked uh, the character of uh, Grief Karga. Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers. I, you know, like it was one of the. He's one of those characters where you're just like, okay, okay. You could see him being a bit. I, I don't know what other character he mentally equates to in my mind. Maybe a little bit Lando, um, because he's got kind of a salesman personality. Um, He's basically Lando without the scruples. I mean, yeah, a little bit. (laughs) Um, uh, But yeah, he's he's just this, uh, like, fun, energetic, kind of charismatic, like, but you know he's a little bit of a con man, too. And you're like, okay, okay. And I kind of didn't think he'd be a thing after like the first couple of episodes. And then when he Same comes here. back in later and I was like, yes, I'm so glad they went the route of giving him a little bit more to do because it made me way more interested in his character. Well, Carl yeah, Weathers yeah. is like Ming-Na Wen. He's one of those actors who you don't, you don't just bring him in for a cameo and have it be done. <laughs> you got, you got to give him some scenery to chew. Yeah. He's got to like, just kick someone's ass. Well, just a little like- bit. Like, that's the thing. They could have wasted Carl Weathers, but the thing is, he has such comedic timing. Like, if you've ever seen him in Arrested Development, he's fucking hysterical when you get him in the right situation. And I have a feeling they probably let him play a little bit with some of his scenes. But when he wants to get serious, he's like Dylan from fucking Predator. And he really digs into it. And the fact that they made him interesting, because that character could have been one and done. They could have killed him off in the third episode and let that character go. But when they brought him back in the eighth episode, they didn't have to. And they gave him enough stuff to work with. So the fact that him and Cara Dune have kind of teamed up, that's interesting as hell. So go space Carl Weathers. I'm so happy you're in this show. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and then I also, I, even though uh, Moff Gideon was not in it a lot, I love Giancarlo Esposito. Yes. Um, I feel like I never recognize him in a role. Do you, do you, because he transforms into his characters so well. And for me, everything I see him in is so different from the last role I saw him in. So like having him in this, playing a character type that I've never really seen him play before is really exciting. So I'm really, mm, 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 mm. that's going to be fun. I think that's going to be fun. Okay. Uh, for, for me, uh, before I, I get to, to the big one that I want to shout out, I want to give a, I want to Herzog, who he's, he's one of those actors. He, he, he could have laughed the, the producers out of the room when they approached him to, to do this show. Like just looking just, the man has just that kind of pedigree, but he came into this and he, he, he was he did not phone it in at all like uh, it was clear he he was having a lot of fun with his role uh and he actually said in interviews that he he, he found doing the mandalorian one of the most fun things he's ever done and i was really disappointed that they didn't do more with him but at the same time you know you you, you he's also one of those one of those actors who he steals every scene that he's in mm-hmm. so i get why they why they used him sparingly because you know it's it's he, he's he's the cherry on the sunday but if we're going to talk about awesome performances we have got to give the gold medal to Pedro Pascal oh, as man. the Mandalorian. This oh, man so spends ninety nine point nine 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 percent repeating in ad infinitum, wearing full armor and a helmet. We only see his face for a grand total of like thirty seconds, but this man's body language and the way he 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 performs with his 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 body and his movements 
like it would have been it, 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 it they could so easily have have made mando into just this this basically an, an automaton with no personality he would be just like kind of almost like boba fett was in the empire strikes back he would he, he just kind of was just there uh in every scene he was in but no pedro was able to to just through physicality imbue mando with such personality and i have just got to give him props for his performance in the series because it is so difficult to put forward a good character performance when your face is obscured throughout the entire series and he just knocked it out of the fucking park and, yeah and to go to go along with how well he did uh like the writing of the character you know because we've always seen boba fett as like this quiet badass and that is clearly what they wanted us to think first about mando and he definitely gives off that like i'm the lone i'm a lone wolf i'm just i'm just looking out for number one um and you you see that like break down like very quickly you get to see these different sides of him and you see how how trusting he can be and how vulnerable he can be and it's just so nice to see because they they could have just done like this like like a judge dread kind of like i'm just blam 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 and then kill all the enemies and be done with it but they made him such an interesting character while giving him so little dialogue because really he doesn't have that much like he doesn't have that much dialogue and they they managed to get through a lot of character development in a very short amount of time in a very natural way and i really think that he just did an amazing job with that Okay. Any other uh, cast members that deserve shoutouts before we move on to presentation? No, when you will be avenged. I think Taika Watiti did an amazing job as IG Eleven because that could have been just oh, I'm the funny character, but no, nah, there's some funny moments. There's an incredibly emotional moment towards the end of the first season that I didn't expect, and that guy deserves a lot more credit than I think he gets um, acknowledged for. Like, I just saw Jojo Rabbit a few weeks ago, and when he plays funny Hitler, it's hysterical, and he channels the same energy for IG-11 at times, and it's just, it's so great, and I hope to see him do more stuff in Hollywood. I mean, that, that character... Um, well, can't say too much more. I've probably alluded too much to it, but it's fantastic. Uh, other characters that stood out to me, Bill Burr as a stormtrooper. Evidently, there's Boston in space now, um, which was hysterical to me because when they're doing the prison break episode, he's like, I'm not a stormtrooper. I can actually hit things. Um, that was pretty funny, I thought. Uh, seeing Clancy Brown as a Devorian. I didn't even recognize him. I'm thinking, that's the fucking Kurgan? Um, which that was kind of neat. Um, the girl who played Nymphadora Tonks was the Twi'lek sister from that episode. I didn't recognize her. Un under Natalia the Tana. Yeah, didn't recognize her. I'm like, Tonks? Um, so that was cool. Um, but yeah, like all the guest stars did really, really good jobs. And I guess because they get to play in Star Wars, you're going to raise your game up to 11, especially if you're a huge nerd. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if we see more people become voice cameos or do stuff in this world. Because I know Daniel Craig was a stormtrooper in Force Awakens. Kevin Smith was. So don't, don't be surprised if you see other people do voice cameos or maybe I'm a droid or I'm random shopkeeper number 11 or something like that. You'll see more cameos as time goes on. Like I can't wait till they announce Mandalorian casting season two, because I have a feeling we'll see some names we did not expect. I, I think it would be fun if this became the new thing that everyone wants a cameo in because you know, it's been the Marvel movies for so long that everybody, everybody wants to cameo in it and um, they get a little, uh, a little, I don't know what the right word is but they get they stand out a little bit at times um <laughs> but in fun fun ways and i think this would be a good thing for everyone gets a cameo i'd also be interested to see how many more game of thrones actors they could throw into the show 
All right. Uh, so I guess with, with, with that, let's uh, jump into uh, the next area of our autopsy, and that's the presentation. And this is another area where I was really impressed because, you know, there, you know, well, not so much nowadays with stuff like Game of Thrones, uh, but it's it, it now. There's been the stigma for a long time that you, you, for visual effects, you don't really bring your A game uh, for TV. You save the, the the movie level stuff for the theaters. But I mean, the the visual effects in this series. I mean, they were right on par with the films, as far as I was concerned. Uh, the CG, the the CGI ships, the space, the space scenes were all beautifully done. That looked like they could have come right out of the theatrical films. The practical effects for the ver- various aliens and creatures were all astounding. Uh, Baby Yoda, I don't fucking, I could swear that that was an actual real creature at some points with how how lifelike its movements were in some scenes uh although i do kind of have to laugh at at times where you kind of see him walking a- along beside man i'm like man his his little feet must be you know moving around like fucking you know <laughs> cartoon dust trails underneath that robe yeah and that puppet cost five million dollars holy god yeah like john favreau said in the scene where the biker scouts punched the the pump the the puppet the jason sadakis actually punched the puppet and john favreau walked up and said okay good first take good job but i just want you to know that's a five million dollar puppet so bear that in mind and he's like oh shit um so yeah if you break a really expensive prop walt disney will rise from his grave um (laughs) so there you have it but yeah they put money on the screen this is the show which a lot of future television will now be judged game of thrones looked good very rarely did it look hokey mandalorian raised sci-fi television to an entirely new level the expanse looks great but this takes it to a whole new level. I I would actually disagree um, just a little bit. And it's mostly because of that prison break episode, because I'm sorry, but uh, um, there was some Buffy level uh, uh, monster makeup going on in there. Uh, well, the Devorians have always looked like that. I, but that I just, first I off, it's Devoronians. It. Whatever. <laughs> I just can't help it. Everyone that I have talked to agreed that, like, you legitimately look exactly like a... Like, I can think of an episode where I saw that Buffy villain. Like, I remember a specific Buffy episode. Like, it it did not strike me as being very... Like, even if it's canon, it didn't look like Star Wars to me, Is 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 the is what I took away from it. Like, it just didn't have the right mm, vibe it didn't give off it it was buffy okay um <laughs> yeah i'm i I'm, mean I'm, at least as far as the prison break episode i'm inclined to agree especially with the makeup effects on some of the the alien characters the the the, the, the twilight the twi'lex especially um i don't know i just feel like the the, the makeup and and costuming uh for for that episode was kind of yeah subpar and bill yeah, burr's it, it, costume was a little bland and it didn't need to be perfect in that episode because that wasn't, you know, one of the monumental episodes. But I will also say that I was actually kind of disappointed in the um, in the big finale because a lot of it felt like it was on a very closed set. Like it was, it just kind of moved from a couple of set pieces to a couple of set pieces, and they were kind of smaller set pieces. Um, and and I was expecting something maybe a little bit more spacey or a bigger fight or something but because something more grandiose a, yeah yeah it really felt like a lot of it was clinging to one location because it's obviously going to be cheaper to film at one location um and it felt like a very studio fight um and so i was a little bit disappointed that like okay okay still here they're still they're still here okay now they're in another set and now they're in, it, it, like there was a couple of things that i think lasted just a little bit too long that i felt like was them buying time to pad the episode a little bit so i was actually just a little bit disappointed in the final episode because it was this big season finale and there should have been these really like they should have like really gone whole hog on it and they did with all of the characters but less with the setting well, on the note of uh, of of, shoot, of feeling it's shot on a studio, I was surprised as hell to find out there was absolutely no location shoot series. That everything was done on a closed set, and I'm like, motherfucker, you could have fooled me. Just that one yep. episode where they were on the farming planet, 
Like, I could have swore they'd, that they'd gone out to, like, the rice fields, you know, like, an, an actual Asian rice field or something to shoot that. So, like, the set design uh, in this series, uh, big thumbs up to the set designers, except on that Prison Break episode. We, we, we The Prison Break episode on its own was just kind of... I get the feeling that was just kind of the the, the, the junk episode. It's like, all right, we need, we need another episode. All right, uh, make a bottle episode. But the set design... Uh, was phenomenal that it, I, I seriously thought that they were location shooting throughout the, throughout most of the series and to find out that it was all done on a closed set I mean wow that's all I can say about that just wow another thing that I want to give a shout out for is the music uh, I went in expecting a lot of big bombastic John Williams type scores and I got absolutely none of that and what I really what we got instead was a sort of subdued soundtrack that mm-hmm. you know it 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 gave the it gave the right mood to the scenes without overpowering it. Because one of the things that it, that as much as as big a Star Wars fan as I am, I have to acknowledge happens is sometimes the music can kind of overpower what's happening on screen. Um, and it, I didn't get any of that in this series. It was just this this great. Uh, it worked. This, yeah, it, it, it was just it, it was it supplemented the, the the series with that sort of overpowering. So big uh, big props to Ludwig Göransson. Uh, the composer for this series, uh, for his work. So, uh, and I, I, and I know I'm probably the only person who notices this, as Cat repeatedly says. But I'm going to ask anyway. What did you guys think of the score of this series? I loved how it fit with the scenes. Like you said, it wasn't overpowering. It worked parallel with it. It brought emotion when it needed to. It wasn't. It w- It was a character in so much that it made you feel things. It made you. It, it, it knew when to touch on the heartstrings. It knew when to get you excited. It was a very good companion piece. And for television scores, which is something a lot of people don't really appreciate, this is fucking fantastic. I loved it. The Mandalorian theme is so great. Um, I've heard a Trap remix of it, which I think is really interesting. Um, so, yeah, like, they did a job. And to speak a little bit about sound design for this thing, too, a, a lot of, of a big part of Star Wars is sounds like Star Wars. You know what a speeder bike sounds like. You know what a blaster sounds like. And it's nice to see a Star Wars property over eight hours, give or take, that doesn't have the snap hiss of a lightsaber except for the end. It didn't have to rely on sound tropes, like, here's a TIE fighter, here's an X-Wing, here's a blaster cannon. No, it developed its own sound identity, and I think that's something that should be commended as well. All right, Kat, what about you? Score and sound on this uh, this series. Um, I I actually like all of those sound tropes out of Star Wars. They're practically... Oh, yeah, so do I. Uh, But um, I, I thought it was all good. Um, I liked Mando's theme quite a lot. Um, I, th- I thought that it lent itself to building up the image that we kind of all came away with, that um, it was a little bit more of a spaghetti western than it was um, like a normal Star Wars uh, piece of media. It was just a little bit more of a spaghetti western. It had some spaghetti western themes, and I thought that the music lent itself to that to kind of pull us away from this is just another space war. This is this is something a little bit more personal, a little bit, I don't want to say down to earth, but it was a little bit more down to earth. L- l- a little, little bit more, more grounded. A little more yeah. boots boots on the ground. Yeah. Um, and I thought that that did, that did a, um, a good job of that. Okay, all right. Uh, so then let's see. Uh, is there anything else worth talking about here? Um, Oh, I wanted to talk about something that really super impressed me. Okay, the, well, then the, the floor artwork, is yours. The artwork in the end credits. Yes. Oh my God, I can't even describe how nice it was to um, just watch the credits and get to see a beautiful, like a you know, new piece of art. And it wasn't, you know, like a still frame and it wasn't just a blank screen. It was a really amazing, I think those were painted by Filoni, weren't they? I don't know who, but they were. They do look painted, so they, they, they look like genuine Ralph McQuarrie paintings. Who, for, yeah. for for those of you who know, he was the guy who did the, all the concept artwork for the original trilogy. It, and I thought they looked like yes, they looked like like an older sci-fi kind of theme to them. They looked like something out of like the '60s. 
um, that you would throw into a like an, as an advertisement for the film, you know, kind of thing. And I just thought they were so beautiful, and I want wall art of all of them. I want a book like, of all that art. Yeah, like an art book coming out of it would be a really hot ticket. Um, just some posters I'd really like. I'd, I'd frame those and just line my halls with them. It'd be so nice. And it was just such a it was such a different thing to put in, you know, because we tend to skip through credits quite a lot because we're not usually getting that much out of it. And they really I don't know if it was specifically so that they could highlight the talent that went into making the show, but it made me watch the credits. I hope those pictures are available somewhere as high res wallpapers. Um, but yeah, I agree. Like I'm almost I, I know it was someone fairly high up who did the artwork for those and they look amazing. Like I'm astounded just how much that they would think to put that in as like a credit thing. Like that's I, such a little thing. I thought it lent itself even more thematically to the idea that it's a bit more spaghetti Western because it made me think of like, um, like a poster for a Western film. Yes. Completely. And I thought agree. it just, it really tied it all together for me. And it was just so surprising and really, really pleasant because I'm not an artist, but I love following artists and and just looking at things and things that are pretty and shiny and make me happy. And this really made me happy. It, it for me, was one of the biggest takeaways was that they were willing to put in that much extra effort into it. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. All right, so uh, with that, let's uh, start kind of winding things down by giving our final thoughts on uh, The Mandalorian, and I guess I'll start with this. Like I said at the at the top of the show, the thing that I liked so much about this series was that it showed us a, a facet of the Star Wars universe that we don't we don't really get to see all that often, especially in in the in in films. Um, so much of Star Wars is based around this big epic Jedi versus Sith, the Force, galaxy spanning. Uh, conflict, uh, but I found that you know some of my favorite pieces of Star Wars media are the more boots on the ground stuff. Like my favorite Star Wars books will always and forever be the X Wing series, uh, the Rogue Squadron and Wraith Squadron series. Um, those will always be my favorite Star Wars books. So I've always loved the stuff that that focuses more on kind of the little stories of the Star the Wars people. universe. Yeah, and and this is what and that's what we got with the Mandalorian. That's what the Mandalorian gave me, and it did it with such character, with such uh, such a concentrated infusion of character that I I, I I'm inclined to agree with my dad. This is the, this is the best Star Wars has been, maybe not ever, but for a very long for a very long time, and I'm really interested to see how it, how other Star Wars properties maybe follow off of this. You know, I'd love to see more, like, for example, with the Obi-Wan series, I'd love to see more of this kind of boots on the ground type stuff. So it's definitely gotten me excited. So while, so while I've, I've uh, excuse me. So while I've gone kind of a kind of tepid on the, uh, on, on the Star Wars films, uh, the future Star Wars in television, I'm actually really excited to see. I'm excited to see some new stories. Uh, it's particularly uh, where, where this one goes. Kat, what about you? Um, I really, really enjoyed this series. I don't think it's this coming of Christ that everyone treats it as. Um, because I, I did think it had some weaker parts to it, but I really thought that overall it was just a really great show. You can tell the people who made it put in everything that they had into it. You could tell the people who made it had a lot of fun making it. That um, I really like that it took a different... Um, it had a different feel to it. It it didn't strike me as feeling like Star Wars. It kind of felt like Firefly, which is, I know, one of the things that uh, people have compared it to. So I don't mean to make like a really trite comparison, but it really had more of that feeling to it, um, which is something I've missed a lot is having a show like that. Um, so overall, uh, or it kind of felt a little bit like an anime, um, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so it was good to have something that's that's Star Wars, and it it kind of feels like Star Wars, but it also feels like something new that we haven't really you know gotten our hands into before. It was nice to have a Star Wars that wasn't a Star War, uh, like you said. It's not it's not like a, a big space battle. It's not you know Jedi versus Sith. It's it's not the Skywalker legacy. It's it's just some people, and they're just doing some stuff. And there's a really cute little little baby Yoda in it, and it's just the 
I mean, like, this show 100% has earned, like, the global phenomenon that it became just baby Yoda and, like, Mando being so cool all the time. Um, so I can't wait to see what Halloween costumes are going to come around this year. Because tattoos, gonna... man. Guaranteed oh. there'll be some Mudhorn tattoos. Yeah, yeah it's going to be, I think, especially once the next season comes out, um, I think it's just going to get better and better. Okay. All right. And uh, Birdman, final thoughts on The Mandalorian. Okay. One of the things that I love about The Mandalorian is it seems so consistent with the original trilogy canon. This is something, it's a, re it's, it's a world that we don't know a lot about because the new Disney canon, it jumps immediately to The Force Awakens, which was 15 years after Return of the Jedi. This is a world that we don't know a lot about. This is the after the fall of the Empire, but before the true rise in the era of the new Republic. And that's fascinating. It's so consistent. And I love that. It feels like, as you said, boots on the ground. This is about people. This is your Rogue One. In my opinion, I gave more of a shit about the Mandalorian in in eight episodes than I gave anything in the three new movies. I would watch the Mandalorian over again over the new movies any day of the week. Um, I would also watch the extended media, and that's the thing. This has more in common with the old EU in terms of expanding the scope of stories, like the old books, like Tales of the Bounty Hunters, Tales of. Jabba's Palace, Tales from Moss Eisley Cantina. And I like how it just it gives you a slice of the galaxy without involving lightsabers and Darth Vader every 10 minutes. It's fascinating. It gives us something new and interesting. And it gives us characters that we genuinely care about. Like people have done amazing cosplay already of the Mando right now. Like I know there's a big uh, Twitter thread that's like kind of blowing up where this girl has done this amazing Mandalorian armor in full Beskar steel where it's not all scarred up. It looks weathered, but it looks new if you catch my drift. It looks fantastic. Um, I'm so excited to see where this universe is gonna go. And I think Star Wars is tele or history or future plans. If you can do this level on television and give me six to eight hours of solid Star Wars content, then do that. I'm willing to give the Star Wars movies a break for quite some time. I don't need an old Republic movie that takes place 4,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, which, side note, I own the Star Wars Visual Dictionary. Uh, the company always sends it to me whenever there's a new edition. And instead, like in the old universe, they used to they used to refer to things to as before the Battle of Yavin, so BBY or something. And now it's BSI before Star Killer Incident. So Disney's trying to insert their new canon into everything. Mandalorian doesn't do that. It recognizes that this is leading towards the new canon, but Mandalorian is firmly placed in the OT with acknowledging this is a new path and that's exciting. I haven't been excited for Star Wars since Revenge of the Sith when I had every single action figure, every single exclusive, I had every single FX lightsaber. I actually sold Gonzo my old Graflex lightsaber. That's how little I cared about Star Wars. Now I'm back into the property looking at who knows, maybe someday I'll find someone to build me a Mandalorian helmet. I haven't cared about Star Wars in years. I'm excited again, and that's something I can't say about much. All right. So with that, this is our uh, this is the part of the show where we give our final rating on. So uh, I guess uh, the the real question is since it's been out long, the people who've seen it have already seen it. So I guess the question is the real question is is uh is is this series worth the the subscription price of Disney Plus? Uh so uh so what do you guys think? Is this uh is is, is this is this what are your Basically, what's your final rating on this series? Before I oh, again, again. would watch again. Yeah. And it 100% is is worth subscription. It, it'll be rough patch waiting for the next season, though. It's going to be <laughs> real rough. Well, uh, you, 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 I, I'm sure in your case, Kat, you are consoling yourselves with the wait by uh, Marathon and Gargoyle again for the 10th time. <laughs> I really need to. I haven't actually been watching any television. I caught up on Witcher and I podcast. So, say again, you cut out for a bit there. Sorry, I, I was saying I caught up on Mandalorian. I caught up on podcast land where I've been for like the last 
actually watch that much television. But I did make a nice long queue of stuff to watch on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> All right. And uh, I, I, I'm going to agree. This, is, this series knocks it out of the park. It is definitely worth the price of admission uh, to, to get yourself that. It's definitely worth that Disney Plus subscription. And I'm really excited to see what the future of Star Wars television holds. So, uh, yeah. And uh, so with that, that's about all the time that we have for Third Power this week. Uh, don't forget, next week, first episode of Fools Who Ride is coming out. Uh, our Dungeons & Dragons style podcast. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we will see you next week for Fools Who Ride and the week after that for Nerd of the Third Power. As always, I'm Dr. Gonzo. I'm the cat. This is the way. <laughs> all right. We'll see you guys next week. Taka, play us out. <laughs>